Thanks for listening to Exploring the Wine Glass podcast, the podcast for people who love wine. I'm Lori Budd, a UC Davis winemaking program and WSET Level 2 graduate. You can find Exploring the Wine Glass on all the socials as well as your favorite podcast catchers. If you haven't subscribed yet, now's the perfect time. I promise I'll never tell you what to drink, but I'll always share what's in my glass. Hey everyone, on today's podcast, I am taking you to New York for an intimate tasting with the Zinfandel Advocates and Producers, better known as ZAP, and owner of CorkBuzz, Laura Ferravante. The event was held at CorkBuzz New York City, and its purpose was to help explore Zinfandel's place on the world stage of wine, preserving legendary Zinfandel vineyards in California, and why Zinfandel is, according to those passionate about the variety, one of the most versatile food wines out there. I hope you enjoy. Slancha. I just wanted to recognize your great work in pulling this together, and thank you, and also thank you. And I wanted to kickstart the conversation, if I might. What defines a legend? So having undertaken the exploration of Zinfandel for over 30 years, Zap offers the following for consideration. Defining a legend can be a difficult feat, but there is one thing that is for sure. Legends are timeless. Their contributions will long after them, and they are immortalized for greatness. Legends can create a long-lasting effect, and we honor them. So we invite you to enter the discussion in what defines a legend. So you are taking away. Thank you again. Thank you. Um, So, good morning um, uh, to everyone. If you don't know me already, uh, I'm Laura Manick. I'm the owner of Quirk Buzz, and I'm a master sommelier. Um, As far as Zap is concerned, I am not a producer of Zinfandel, but I am an advocate. Um, I often say that Zinfandel is one of my favorite grapes, which might sound a little um, crazy because so many of our colleagues sommeliers like, oh, no, Pinot Noir is my favorite grape. But the reason that I think Zinfandel is my favorite grape is because it is so versatile. And I think you're going to see in this um, tasting that there's so many different faces or um, expressions of Zinfandel. And so I, um, I'm really pleased to show you all of these lines and to have um, such a, an, a, an accomplished and esteemed panel here. Uh, we're going to start at my far right, and I'm going to introduce David Apadia. He's the president of Bridge Vineyard. So I've long been a fan of Bridge Wines. Um, an incredible uh, legendary winery. Um, and so um, I think David said it perfectly. Um, his job right now is to ensure that the next 50 years at Ridge um, uh, continue the same way as the previous 50 years. So your role as the president, um, he, um, well, you pretty much do everything at Ridge. Um, so, um, but prior to Ridge, um, David worked for six years with South Park Group. He's the vice president in charge of Canada and Latin America. Um, he worked for Randall Graham, another great uh, winemaker, as the vice president of sales and marketing um, at Bobby June. Um, and he was um, instrumental in, in taking the winery to screw cap closures. So we're really pleased to have you here and excited to taste the wines of British. Um, and next on, on my uh, immediate right is Nicole Sal- uh, Salango. She's a winemaker at Various at Gap. Um, this is very exciting to talk about um, these wines from Yolo County, and maybe some of the audience has not even heard of where Yolo County is. So I'm very excited to show these elegant and restrained side of Zinfandel, and I'll let you talk a little bit about that after. Um, so Nicole was um, uh, uh, UC Davis after college. She earned winemaking certificate and viticulture and analogy. Um, she's really passionate about Yellow County and the regional terroir, which I'm excited to hear more about. Um, and so, so yeah, so we have um, uh, that style of wine. Um, and then uh, on my left, we have uh, Kim Stair Wallace. She's um, Dry Creek Vineyard. She's the president and owner. Um, and so her family started um, Dry Creek uh, Vineyards. And so that was, I have it in 1972. See, 19. <laughs> and so currently you're running the winery, um, you're the president, and, and so we'll talk a little bit about Dry Creek Vineyards in a bit. 
Very pleased to have you here. And then last but not least is Aaron Piatter. He's a winemaker for um, all of E&J Gallo Winery with the premium winemaking team. And so he's going to talk to us a little bit about um, the wines as well. And um, I think we'll kick it off by saying, do you guys have anything to say to start about what is, um, what do you think is, uh, is what, stand, what, what does Zinfandel mean in our as far as wine goes, like what should a classic Zinfandel taste like? Which I, I would imagine we're all going to have some different answers. And then we'll talk a little bit about like the legendary vineyards in California. And um, so yeah, maybe if we can just kick it off and talk about Zin, what it means to us, or why we think it's important. I will say one thing before I um, turn it over to you guys. Zinfandel is so versatile with food. And I think often we think they're just big, um, intense, high alcohol wines, which we can see some of those jammy, juicy, big qualities in, in some of our sins, but we also have this light, sweet and sour aromas, and tartness, and bright acidity, and elegance in all of your guys' wines up here. Um, and so I find, you know, anything that um, you can imagine has a sweet and sour, sometimes we, of course, can do barbecue, we can do richer fish dishes, which I think it's, it's amazing to see with, like, trout and salmon, things that have like an inherent sweetness to them. Um, of course, you know, you can have some styles that go well with chocolate and you can do some, um, you know, stews and braises, um, burgers. Um, so there's so many uh, different things that I think that's one of the reasons. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes uh, Zinfandel, the, the legendary vineyards, which I think we'll talk about in a minute, they're being uh, ripped up. So you have these old vines of these young vines throughout the state of California, and people are replacing them with Cabernet um, because maybe it's what the consumer wants. But I think it's really important for us to keep these Zinfandel vines um, in California because of the fact that they represent, um, you know, our, kind of like our California American heritage, if you will. So. All right, that's enough for now. <laughs> I will definitely guide us, but um, Dave, maybe you want to say a few words. Sure. Yeah, in Zinfandel, it's uh, referred to as California's native grape, but I really think of it more as like a lot of us are, is sort of the immigrant that came to the United States and did well. Because uh, it's not really native, it's, it did it, it come from, from Europe, and that's where its uh, home it really is. But it's done much better in California than it's done anywhere else. So it, it sort of represents the American dream in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the idea of uh, what makes great Zinfandel, so now it's sort of putting more of the rich hat on, we really feel that great wines come from great vineyards and great vineyard sites, be it Bordeaux or Burgundy or single vineyard Champagne. It's really the vineyard site and where that is a combination of varietal or varietal mix and soil and climate and it all comes together and that's what enables you as a winemaker to make a great wine rather than starting with an inferior finger and having to insert yourself and really manipulate wine to make a great wine. So Zinfandel came and was planted throughout California and I feel you'll be able to tell me that it's in a lot of counties throughout California. It's probably the most widespread grape in the state of the planting. Uh, but that's not to say everywhere it's planted is making great wine. But I think that the trick in terms of great Zinfandel is finding those locations where it performs the best. And where you can, as a winemaker, step aside and let the wines make themselves. Uh, you know, at Ridge, we've been at it a long time. Uh, we've made Zinfandel from probably nearly 100 different vineyards throughout the state. But through that time, we've whittled it down to those sites that really we feel are great. Uh, where you have this consistency of style, every year it tastes like Geyserville, uh, and, every, and there's a consistency of quality that, you know, 9 out of 10, 10 out of 10 vintages, you're making great wines in that site. So, so I think that's really the, the, the trick, is uh, trying to find those sites. Old Wines plays a huge role in that as well, in terms of the quality of the wines, and being able to preserve those vineyards for future generations, and that's, that's uh, that's what, where the greatness lies, and that's what we need to, to really work individually as a winery and who's out to to protect this. Thank you. And I love what you said about um, the American dream, because I think that it, it is important to talk about the heritage of Zinfandel. And actually, this is a great uh, segue for Nicole, because 
I noticed on the label that you guys produce, you, you have a mention of Kimmel Kivo. Yes. And correct. so maybe we'll just talk a little bit. You can explain what you think is Great Glen and Great Glen Vineyards, and maybe talk a little bit about Willow County, where it is, and why maybe you, you're referencing Kimmel Kivo on the label. Sure. Um, well, I came into wine production from a wine purchasing background, so I worked at a small wine shop in Davis, California. So I would taste a lot of premium wines, and um, originally, you know, like 15, 17 years ago, people were looking for Zinfandel, and I didn't think I really liked it in my early 20s. Um, it tended to be really concentrated, higher alcohol, like you just have a glass of it. And, you know, it's difficult to have more because of that high alcohol concentration. So, once I started working in production um, and came to this vineyard site, I realized very quickly it is all about the site. And the family that I work for currently, uh, they run a rootstock company, so that's the plant material to start a vineyard. They have run that since the 60s, and they have a great reputation for quality plant material. So that's why they selected Primitivo. They did some trials in Yolo County, so Yolo County is at the edge of the Central Valley, just east of Napa, um, and it's in the Arbiter site, so it's a speaker site in the foothills of the coastal range, and it's the only Zinfandel that I'm aware of planted within, I don't know, like a 30 mile radius. So, um, frankly, it's my favorite variety, the red variety that we are creating at Arisa Gap, and we're working with 12 red varieties <coughs> and it was really surprising to me but it is the wine that I need to work with the least and yet they need to work with the most in the vineyard so um, I do think the Primitivo that they selected that was planted in 2000 so we're working with younger vines um, and I personally am finding you know, coming up on my seventh harvest with Barry Essig out we are the vineyard's coming into a, its prime. We're, um, we're not having to drop fruit as much, and I think that really speaks to the quality of the wine. The older the vines get, the better. I'm noticing the quality of the resulting wine that I'm making is getting. Um, do I answer your questions? Yeah, all right. right. <laughs> <laughs> and so maybe we'll talk a little bit about um, drug fruit. That would be a good segue. And so we're kind of representing all the different regions of uh, Great Zinfandel, and maybe you want to talk a little bit about what Zinfandel is to you and what you're trying to achieve, or what you think um, you guys, uh, what's your uh, style? And I have five hours to do that? Yes. <laughs> so, um, gosh, well, first of all, Zinfandel is the perfect breakfast wine. Yes. <laughs> um, well, so Nicole said they've had seven harvests. We're coming up on our 47th harvest. So my family has been in the Dry Creek Valley since 1970. We were the first winery there after Prohibition. And thankfully, my father made Zinfandel. And, um, you know, I think Dry Creek Valley, which is one of, gosh, I think there are now 18 ABAs in Sonoma County. Uh, and we're at the northern end of Sonoma County, but Dry Creek Valley is considered kind of the cosmic epicenter of Zinfandel in California, if you will. And maybe my colleagues would argue that. But Zinfandel was brought to Dry Creek Valley in the late 1800s by the Italians that settled there. And my family has had the great fortune of working with some extraordinary vineyards, and it is absolutely true um, what both David and Nicole said, that it all starts in the vineyard. Um, my, the two lines that I, I'll taste, you know, that I brought that I'll share with you couldn't be more different, but they also reflect very exciting um, vineyards. One is extremely, extremely old, and one is uh, not young, not old, but has the DNA from the old vine bloodwood. So, I think, you know, the Zinfandel vineyards that we have, we, we can thank our Italian forefathers. You know, one keep in mind, many of these Zinfandel vineyards are field plants, so they were planted with a variety, a mishmash of grapes. And in some cases, we don't even know of all of the different grapes, but, you know, it could be Trousseau, Brie, and Robetta, and, and um, oh gosh, all kinds of other things that are, you know, varietals that we don't even, you know, that aren't commonplace these days. So. Um, there, Zinfandel is definitely my favorite wine, and I was raised on Zinfandel. It's the wine that I drink every day, and I agree with you, Laura. I think it is one of the most versatile wines in, in the world, to be honest, and it, it, it ties in perfectly with American cuisine. Um, 
one of the things I think that's very important for Zinfandel, and certainly any world-class producer of Zinfandel, is balance. So Zinfandel is a, it's, it's one of, if you ask uh, Aaron and you students, but uh, my winemaker constantly tells me, and he's had you know, decades of experience, that Zinfandel is, as, is um, one of the most uh, challenging grapes, and almost sort of like the Pinot Noir. And one of the reasons why is it's an uneven ripening grape cluster. So in harvest, or in you know in the fall during harvest, oftentimes you'll have different colored berries. You'll have green berries within the purple berries, and and you know the, the, the clusters don't all har uh, ripen at the same time. So it really takes a seasoned winemaker to know when to make those picking decisions. And so sometimes when you get into these very overripe, high alcohol, jammy style Zinfandel that have kind of dominated the market, maybe years that are thankfully starting to go away. I think part of that is some, you know, somewhat inexperienced picking decisions. But in terms of, you know, the, the, my my approach and my philosophy of Zinfandel is that it has to showcase balance. It has to have absolutely those unique um, uh, uh, cranberry, blackberry, boysenberry fruit tones. But it also has to have that beautiful spice that you only get from Zinfandel, whether it's cardamom nutmeg, cinnamon, or black pepper, white pepper, um, and then acidity. You have to have the right amount of acidity. So overall, the balance is what we're looking for, whether it's a really bold, you know, old vine style, or uh, perhaps something a little more feminine. Balance is really what's the key, and, and Zinfandel, I think, frankly, can showcase that better than many varieties, certainly many red varieties. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Oh, that's but, amazing. Um, uh, <laughs> let's see, I guess I'll... Stop there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, and we'll go back yeah. to some of these points. Like we'll talk about Miller on Dutch and like alcohol and un uneven ripening and where that might happen. How we can like maybe use that natural uneven ripening to achieve the, the different styles. I'm curious about that. But maybe Erin, uh, you want to talk a little bit about what your thoughts are about Zin and what makes a, a, a legacy vineyard. And sure. Yeah. First of all, I'll answer Rebecca. She asked you guys to think about what is legacy. The ricotta that's in front of you. Oh, <laughs> I have you. I have you. That's my grandma's recipe for ricotta. So it's a, it's a great find. Um, so I'm in my 26th year. I was born and raised uh, in the town of Sonoma. I'm kind of born and raised where Zinfandel emerged. Um, I'm lucky enough to work with a vineyard called Monterosa. So as Nicole mentioned, vines get better as they get older. Uh, it's a 126 year old uh, vineyard that's still quite active in production. Luckily, uh, Zinfandel for us is exempt from all forms of efficiency and farming metrics and yield and all that sort of thing that were it would be pulled out a long time ago. Um, in modern trellising, modern farming of grapes, we tend to look at breaker quality, style, all that sort of thing. But it's got a, it's got a big bills as well. And Zinfandel, those old vines up there, they're gnarly, they're crazy looking, they branch out all over the place, they're a mess, and they are low yielding. Um, but no one's going to touch them. There's not a finance person who says that's not yielding the proper tonnage. Uh, it's got to come out of the ground. It's fantastic. So in terms of legacy, um, as I mentioned, these plantings that are there for well over 100 years, they're just magical. Uh, we have two locations. We have the uh, eastern hills of the Sonoma Valley, which is where Monterosa was situated. And then we also are in the Dry Creek Valley. So the winery I work at for our brothers is one of the oldest vineyards and areas of Dry Creek. That were neighbors across the street. Uh, Zinfandel to me is fantastic to make. It's fun. You can kind of print your style upon it. Um, and making cab and all sorts of other varieties that I have in the past, uh, Zin lets you have the freedom to make something energetic and vibrant and in a sense safe. Or you can make something really juicy and generous. Or you can push it to the limit and just know you're going to be on your heels all the the entire fermentation, you're going to be on defensive mode. Uh, and those styles are in bottles of wine, which you guys have seen. I think the latter are the high alcohol, really big, intense Zin. So that's a choice. Uh, when you're looking at that cluster, as they mentioned with the, we call it chicks and hens, there's big berries, little berries, and little ones dehydrated on gamma raisins, and the perfect ones are kind of dimpled and mid sized. Um, the big ones are more cranberry, raspberry, have more acid. Uh, the little shriveled ones are more of your kind of juicy jammy style and those little raisins are going to be buggers that are going to make fermentation tricky and you know they're in there doing their thing. Um, so stylistically, with Merlot, Cabernet, Pinot for that 
you wouldn't pick something early, very early stylistically, because of things you don't want. It's full of greens, or the tannins aren't right, or there's too much forest floor or earthy character, or even florals, right? Not enough gener uh, generosity in the fruit. So you tend to have this sort of centric mind when picking the varieties. You want the texture to soften. Um, and so within, texture's there. You pick early, you're going to have that cranberry, raspberry, and florals, if you will. Uh, you let it go a little more, you get a darker red spectrum, and then you go to the end. And we thought we picked in the middle. By the time it soaks up, we realize we're closer to the end in the middle. Uh, but then you can choose that whole spectrum. And stylistically, we brought uh, two lines that we make that are right in the middle of the spectrum, and then one very close to the end of the spectrum. <laughs> this, uh, uh, that's very representative of the sites, but all three of my colleagues have mentioned. Uh, if you want barrels, you can buy the same barrels as us. Just get out your credit card, call Cooper, you can have whatever barrel you want. If you want tanks, you can have a fancy tank in your backyard if you want, no big deal. Uh, all the equipment, that's open game. What people do have that makes them unique and special are the sites that they use. And, uh, and Zinn is very, very unique in its site. I think we'll see as we go through fruit profile, acid levels, spiciness, earthiness, all those things are very distinct to the site. So I think Zinn speaks to terroir fantastically. Um, and we can say with great pride, even as neighbors, there's little nuances on the you know, more hillside than there is on the more fertile valley floor of Dry Creek Valley, just within Dry Creek itself, which is amazing person. So it's going to be fun to say students. Yeah, I'm about these two lines, but they're feeling some of them, and one made a little bit more of a dreaming site. I'll talk about the vineyard site. So I talked about how we're, our, the Cobal Ranch, our 60 acre site, is planted in the foothills of the coastal range. It, the site was planted, the, vine, the Primitivo selection of Zinfandel um, was planted in 2000. And it's kind of in these rolling hills, it's only at, at about 100 to 125 feet elevation, so not at elevation. Warm climate, um, as I mentioned, but we have, you know, our namesake, Berryessa Gap, is named after a landmark in the mountains, which is literally a gap in the coastal range to the west of our vineyard. And behind that, further to the west, is Lake Berryessa. So we have these warm days, 110 degrees is not abnormal, but uh, at night, we get really strong prevailing winds from the west. Neat thing about our vineyard site. I live like a mile south, south of the vineyard and I don't get those winds at my house. So, Winters is known for a lot, I have a lot of microclimates historically. It's a big ag community. And so I believe, you know, uh, the warm days, you get these nice, bright red fruit flavors, and then you cool down at night. A lot of your fruits can rest and um, develop. Our flavors. Um, the Primitivo is the first red variety to be harvested every year, but that's partially because I pick it early. Um, I'm all about acidity. You may know in a warmer climate, uh, it's more challenging to preserve natural acidity in wine. So my goal is always to try to pick this, the Primitivo around 25 bricks. Um, as Aaron mentioned, uh, Zin is notorious for creeping up in the fermenter and. and Sugar. So, uh, cream and cheese. I try to pick before we start getting any raisins. Um, that's my goal. So I, I am not afraid of green berries, pink berries. Um, we, I will admit, recently purchased an optical sorter, but uh, even before we were optically sorting, um, I still the optical sorter is more to get the raisins out. Um, I do not sort out like the pink and green berries. Um, and that's probably has something to do with the lighter color here. Another thing is I really try hard to keep all of the wines that I'm making 100% true to the variety for a number of reasons. Uh, a, people aren't familiar with Gilo County. B, not everyone is familiar with Primitivo. So I'm just trying to focus on that so people can come from another our area. Uh, 16, beautiful harvest. Um, frankly, uh, it, the sugar got a little higher than I wanted. So, to, and we ferment in one and a half ton fermenting.
rotation bins. Uh, through the 16 harvest, it was just hand punched down three times a day. I do a cold soak for 48 hours, 55 degrees. I do inoculate. Um, it's just, I, I do have a Zinfandel yeast survey like from the fort. And uh, I also inoculate for malactic. In 16 is the first year I tried a co inoculation. Uh, the idea is to just get the wine through all, you know, all of its fermentation as quickly as possible because what I really love about our Zinfandel is that fresh aspect, that bright acidity. So as wine ages, as we all know, that dissipates. So I really want to preserve that. And the 16, I stopped. We, we press in a five-ton basket press, very traditional. It, but I stop the press early. So I really am nervous about the sugar going up in the press as well. So I'm always looked, looking out for that. Uh, after the fermentation, after the pressing, we age, you know, my philosophy on barrel regimen has to do with the weight of the wine. So these wines are heavy. They're all aged and twice used of barrels, all French. Uh, you know, uh, I have probably about 10 different cougars that I really like, and there are certain ones that I prefer with some of them. And then, am I talking about some of them as well? Um, yeah, I'd sure. I'd like to compare them. Yeah, I would love that too. And then one of the things that I wanted to talk about, and maybe somebody at any point you guys can jump in, is talking about alcohol in Zinfandel, because I think often, it, maybe more us as a trade, when we think about Zen, we're, we're like, oh, they're too high in alcohol, and I want to point out that these ones are about 14.6, 14.8, the first two, and most of Barolo these days are at least that amount. So when we think about saying, you know, oh, Zinfandel is so rich and so big, or it has so much alcohol, many of the world's finest, most age-worthy wines are creeping up in alcohol. I don't think that even though these are 14, you feel them at all. And then, so I think that it's a really good thing when you have brightness of fruit, you have elegant acid, I think that the alcohol levels can be pushed, I mean, that's not high by any means, but like even when you see things like 16 alcohol, if the wine is well crafted and it has the, the structure to match, it doesn't necessarily <coughs> feel like that. It's, it's a really important topic. Of of, of, of thinking about alcohol and, and letting the wine stretch. Like, would you feel that these are that high alcohol? Does anybody feel like a burn or any? No, right? Um, so uh, I also found like with the 16, you, you get like a little bit of, like we said, like a darker, more ruby, um, but it's still light in color. And then when you go to the 17, that's when you, you see like how light and pale and thin skinned and um, smells a little bit more like a, a tartness and a more sour with the still like youthful gemmy qualities which I really enjoy a lot. And I think Kim spoke about the, the balance. So I find Zinfandel can withstand a little higher alcohol. There's a lot of flavors, lots of acids. I have a little suspicion that there's some other weird sugars that we don't monitor for in winemaking that occur in Zinfandel. Um, but so for talking about the 17, it was a much hotter year um, in August. We picked our Zinfandel at the end of August. I tried to get right on my birthday up here. But, um, <laughs> so yeah, so I think it was a hot year. This wine really reflects it. Uh, we, I tried an experiment with a uh, submerged cap method. So I learned about this. I've heard about other winemakers trying it with Pinot Noir and Zinfandel. So I thought I'd try it. So we created these stainless steel screens that we put on our fermenters. And instead of punching down, we just did a reductive fermentation. And we 75% uh, of the wine that you're tasting, um, it was not even mixed during the fermentation. So that also has to do with the lighter color. But it was just, I like to do a lot of experimentation. I'm still trying to figure out our figure and what works best for all of our varieties. And I am really happy with the way our, it turned out in 17. This is more of what I'm trying to achieve. I am looking for an elegance and 
a very approachable and food friendly wine, but um, I also like to chill artisan. <laughs> so I've spent some time in Europe and all of my favorite, I really like more lighter style reds. Um, so they tend to chill in there. So I like to do that at our winery. I was just about to say, like this is the type of zen that you can just serve as a pair of teeth. And you can have a slightly chilled, um, you can imagine it goes well as a like, lighter pair, and so that's really great. Okay, so maybe David, um, I, I'm really, really uh, I'm sure everybody wants to hear a little bit more about the guys who build on the dog with roof rings and how they differ, and, and maybe even talking about blending zin, since your wines are often a blend. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we were asked to, to show two infidels uh, that we think are, are examples of classic sins. So we make probably on average about 15 different sins every year. So there's an array to choose from, but clearly that we feel these are our two most classic infidels. And they're great to show side by side uh, because uh, they're only about two miles apart, but show tremendous differences and they really reflect the unique terroirs of the two sites. Uh, these are both um, Old Vine Vineyards lived in Geyserville, uh, uh, pre-prohibition. Um, Geyserville, uh, the old patch was planted about 1885, so they clearly the oldest vines we worked with at Geyserville. And uh, Living Springs old pet plot patch was planted in 1901, and then a, a second lot in 1910. So these are kind of both very old vine vineyards. Uh, and I always like to say that they, they need to be great vineyards. They survived World War I. Prohibition, World War II, uh, they survived a lot of things with the stolen ground. So I think that's a testament to the quality because there was multiple opportunities to rip these lines out of the ground, but they're still there today. So that alone, I think, is a testament to the, the quality of these old mine sites. Uh, the, uh, they're both field blends. Uh, and you know, we talked about this uh, concept of field blends, but this was no accident. Farmers who planted these vineyards, you know, over 100 years ago, clearly had a plan in mind when they put the vineyards in. Uh, they love Zinfandel. They came to California around 1850. It said the crop, they loved the fruity nature of the wine. It was flexible. They could make rosé. They could make fortified wine. They could make table wine from it. Different styles, so it was flexible in that way. Uh, and it was really well suited. And, and like Kim said. We, we really feel like ground zero for Cinefidel in the world is sort of just right Creek, Alexander Valley, where right? this is the best Cinefidel comes from this area because the climate is perfectly suited for the grain. But the, these, these farmers, when they planted, they, they, um, they realized the, uh, the benefits of Zin, but also its shortcomings. It's thin skin, similar to piano, not deep in color, not deep in tannin. Uh, they need butter to compensate for that. And also in this warm climate, they, uh, they can be, become sub-acid, that they needed an acid punch. So the Petit Sora was interplanted uh, for the color of tannin and carried in, which in very warm climates in South of France and the Central Valley of California still maintains its acidity, provided the acid punch for these plants. Uh, and uh, it, so those were the three key uh, varieties that, that were, were planted together. But we've gone out and mapped both of you guys are going Vineyards. There are 22 varieties that are planted at Geyserville, and there are 18 distinct varieties planted at Lipton Springs. So, including white varieties like Palomino and Riesling, um, Alicante, and uh, other uh, 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 you know, Tinto varieties that are in the field. And we thought it was totally random, but when we mapped with the Springs, we actually saw that in every fourth line and every fourth row at Lipton was planted to Alicante. So there, there, there's an actual grid that was put in. So although it appears random as you walk through the bay, you're getting actually map it because it's actually it was a method to the madness. Uh, and we really feel that uh, these mixed steel blends are, are the key to quality. Uh, for years at, at Ridge, you can ask you to plant it or plant a new vineyard. So we planted solid boxes in Verdell, solid boxes in the TV and carry them, and then blend it afterwards. But it was taking upwards of 10 years for these blocks to make it into our primary blend to be able to guys uh, Then we experimented with recreating these gold line blends, and we 
plant you the same fashion as they were planted over 100 years ago, and immediately these, uh, these uh, new plantings will go into the crop line. So there's something magical about the co-pigmentation of uh, what is in all these other varieties. There's something uh, magical about the combination and that you can't recreate from blending afterwards. That they have to be grown together and co-pigmented to create these great wines. So in terms of the geyser bill, which is the, the wine number three, and that's from the 17 vintage, these, uh, the soil type is different here. This is, uh, this is in, the, in the plains of the Russian River. It's in an old river bed. There's a, a lens of uh, this rocky soil that geyser bill is growing on, which is distinctive from all the soil around it. As we get closer to the Russian River, it gets heavier and wetter the soil, which means the citadel does not like. Cabernet is grown there and it survives, but Zinfandel does not really perform well in that. But in this lens, it produces this unbelievable wine uh, with uh, the blend here always nearing 20% cherry. Uh, so most of the time, it's not even 75% Zinfandel in the, in the gas mill. So Caribbean is the second dominant variety. Then the two Syrah, then Alicante, and then Matara. Uh, and then you, which, which produces a wine with a lot of acidity because the carrying in its top, it's red fruit, it's fresh, uh, and very light. We never have to acidify a guys to the natural acidity from the vineyard and the soil that allows us to make the wine naturally. We never have to monkey with the wine at all. It comes in and make it pretty much straight up. Uh, and then the Little Springs, different soil type. This is in Dry Creek Valley. On the other side of the wine, in Alexander Valley, where guys to build this. Rolling hills, heavier clay loam soils. Uh, and here, Petit Syrah is the second variety. So the combination of the heavier soils and more Petit Syrah complementing this in. This is a, a darker wine, more broad shoulder, more tannic, uh, and more of these grown flavors in the wine I find. So more of that earthy meatiness. It's not a, so much a fruit-driven wine like the guys are It's more of these other tertiary, secondary flavors that drive the wine. Uh, and we were talking about picking decisions. So with a mixed fuel like that with the Geyserville, the, the complexity of picking decision is just amplified. So not only are you dealing with a finicky Zinfandel out there with not even ripening in the clusters, now you're dealing with, you know, the Kirkman not ripening slower than the Zinfandel, the Petit Syrah slower than that. So how do you decide when to pick that maybe which just becomes really complicated. But, and we're shooting for that sort of 23, 24 bricks uh, kind, of, kind of target uh, for picking decisions. Uh, but what you end up with is you end up with some grapes slightly overripe, some perfectly ripe, and some slightly underripe, which, which just in the end adds to the complexity of the wine uh, with, with the different ripening levels with the mixed field. So that just adds another layer of complexity. Uh, we shoot for you know alcohol levels in the low to mid 14s for our Zinfandels. Producing so many Zins, you know, 15, 16 Zins a year, that if we feel like we're up at 15 and a half alcohol, you lose the terroir. The wine starts to taste the same. Lidden tastes like Geyserville, that tastes like Pagani, which tastes like Ponzo. And that's really the beats of purpose. We really are trying to, as winemakers, transmit the personalities of these unique sites to the bottle. Uh, with Zinfandel, which is a great transmitter of terroir, but yet that really, um, that's really deflated if you're, if you're using it too right. You just lose that, that, that sense of place in the alcohol levels. It gets you hot for us. So, I think I probably said it now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love it. I love seeing the different styles of um, both the Indian Geyser, the Geyser Hill side by side. And I think, I mean, I, I wrote the same notes, like, in the Litton, you have uh, more restrained, deeper tannins. Yeah. I'm curious to ask the panel in general, what do you think the tannin level, forget the, the other grapes, what do you think the tannin level of Zin, what classic tannin level for Zin? I mean, I have my opinion, but I'm obviously not a producer. So um, either Kim or Aaron, what, what should a Zinfandel tannin, what should we expect from tannins? So or does tannin come from oak and Zin? Or is it a well, I, I, for me, I, I think you, I expect moderate tannins. Yes. I don't want highly tannic Zinfandel. That's just not good, in my humble right opinion. Um, yes, you get a little oak tannin, certainly depending on the amount of aging, but 
But I think overall we're looking for moderate tannins, you know, the support of a nice balanced structure, but allow the acidity and more, and, and most importantly, the beautiful fruit and beautiful spice tones to come through all harmoniously. I never, I, I, I mean, I, I sometimes get tannins from like guys who are or more important like Leighton, but I, I feel like they're so well balanced with the concentration of the wine, and that makes them so age worthy that have had so many great zins yeah. uh, from you guys that have older vintages and uh, rich and dry grapes should do like the ageability. Oh, I was, yeah, yeah, I wanted to add that. Yes, that, yeah. because yeah. you start to see that now we've already explored how different zin can be in the, the lighter style, the fuller style, the more blue fruits, and more raisinated. But when you see zin age, it's incredible. I mean, I keep saying, I just think Zen is like, in a way, like, now, it just gets better and better as it ages. So, and do you have any questions? Um, Zen itself, like 100% of the that wine is almost seamless in texture. Yeah. It's not a big tan grain, right? It's thin skinned, it's big berry. That's why the tea straw is the end of the end of Zen. So, you've got tea straw the exact opposite. Small berries, all muscle, massive tannin, unruly, if you will. Uh, so, you know, a lot of it's like the dial and mouthfeel or texture, get it layers by using blenders, because Zin itself is just this unbelievably seamless wine. And we make 100% Zins, we want that seamless texture. And when we make a Zin that's multiple sites or we're blending, so I'm not gonna say we're reducing the effect of terroir, but we're combining great sites that have terroir, uh, making more food friendly, user friendly, uh, multi-dimensional wine. Then we use petite Syrah to roll to go, things like that, uh, to build mouthfeel and layers that way. So Zin on its own, Pretty darn light and tan, um, coming from a Bordeaux perspective, or you know, it's just almost non-existent. It should be a seamless uh, te uh, texture all over. Okay, can you tell us about Wallace versus Beeson? Yeah, and a little bit more about those sites. Absolutely. So, so these are both um, estate-driven um, wines, and so the Wallace branch, uh, obviously, well, maybe not obvious. My last name is Wallace. <laughs> um, and my husband and I bought our property, which was this, the 12 acre vineyard, and it's directly behind the winery, adjacent to the winery in 1990. And it was actually planted to the to uh, the old Davis clump, so kind of high yielding, not particularly exciting to the Dell, and we immediately tore it out. And what's really, this is a really special site. Um, so let me just back up. One of the things is, my, in our region, Drake Valley, and having grown up there, one of the things we started to get very worried about in the early, late 80s, early 90s, was that we were losing a lot of these great, historic, old vines and Pendel vineyards, either to disease, but more frequently to people who were moving into the area and buying vineyard -like vineyards and then tearing them out to, um, to plant higher yielding, higher, more profitable wines like, or grapes like Cabernet. And we started to see the demise of many great old Zinfandel vineyards. There was an amazing vineyard called the Ridge Wagon Ranch that we made Zinfandel from for years. And, you know, somebody came in and poured it out and planted cap. So my husband and actually um, our assistant winemaker at the time and our vineyard manager began a technique that was very innovative at the time. And it was called the Heritage Clone Propagation Technique. And this, let me just explain it because it's really important. What, what we did was they went into um, a very old pre-prohibition vineyard, actually the Mazzoni Ranch in Geyserville, and took uh, the cane or the budwood over off the, cut the can, cuttings off, and over the series, a series of years, grafted those onto rootstock um, that was eventually planted in our vineyard right in front of my house. And that, that propagation technique, if you will, where you're trying, what we were trying to do is capture sort of the DNA or really the legacy of the old Mazzoni Ranch Zinfandel in a younger, newer planting. And of course, at the time, and this has now been 25 years ago, everybody thought young Zinfandel vineyards and young vineyards in general weren't as good as old vineyards. So this heritage clone propagation technique, um, and we made what we actually called the, the wine heritage clone for a while, and we changed the name to heritage vine, because the word clone was getting a bad rap because of all the sheep cloning. Remember that years ago? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. That propagation technique was used to develop this vineyard. So we've got the kind of the connection or the DNA to the old vines in a newer Zinfandel planting. And what we found at the time, now this is you know, 2016 vintage, our first vintage was 1997. Um, 
we found that the you know the, the wine had these beautiful raspberry fruit tones, a little bit of boysenberry, and some lovely spice tones, and it was very exciting for us. And we have since used that propagation technique to develop some other estate vineyards. And now it's a fairly widely um, adopted technique in viticulture in our region. So it's not just us that did it, but that's kind of how the origins of this vineyard got started. So. Um, so, having said that, I think that, you know, that in itself it makes it somewhat legendary in the sense that we really, it's a case study of trying to preserve old vine <coughs> vineyards. Um, you'll notice uh, immediately that this is a wine that's, um, you know, much more sort of refined and a little bit softer and maybe a little more feminine than the Beeson Ranch. Um, for me, I get just beautiful fruit tones, almost like a sweet marzipan kind of, um, Sweet almond on the arrow, you know, very perfumed nose, um, nice balance, a little bit of a chocolate cherry, um, you know, kind of maybe flavor, and but just kind of refined structure. Um, I, I don't like to use the word light, but of the two, this is the lighter of the two, and I think you can see it just looking under glass. Um, it would make sense, part of it is it's a 25 year old beer, and this is a 125 year old beer. Um, yeah, decent. So, um, yeah, so that's the Wallace Ranch. Very, very limited production. Uh, it's up on the fish in the middle of Dry Creek Valley, right, like I said, it's right where I live, right near the winery. Um, so I think that's, oh, another thing I was going to say about the Wallace Ranch, which is interesting, is um, my winemaker, Tim Bell, actually, for the barrel aging, uh, designed a specific barrel that he called a fusion barrel, which is it's kind of an innovative concept where we, took, we basically take the heads are French oak and then the staves are a combination of European oak, so Hungarian, Yugoslavian, um, and so hence a fusion of different oak species. And so we done, did that, or he did that, because we wanted very soft, we didn't want a you know, intense oak, um, a strong oak to overpower the delicacy of cinnamon dark fruit. So that's the type of thing, and it's aged for about 19 months. So if you juxtapose that with the Beeson Ranch, now this is, we were talking earlier about old vines, but this vineyard, oh my gosh, you guys, it's amazing. It was planted in the 1890s. So like David said, you know, the, the beauty of these historic vineyards is, think about it, they were planted with a horse and plow, right? You know, they survived all the, you know, the, all the wars and the 1906 earthquake and all these things that have, you know, happened in our culture or in California. I, when I go into this vineyard, I literally get goosebumps. The vines are maybe two feet tall. They're, it's spotty. I mean, they're, you know, we try to replace vines and we do replace vines, but it's kind of, it's kind of spotty. Um, the vines are actually completely hollow. When my husband first came to work for my dad in the early, actually in 1990, he was a ranch manager. And I remember Don came home one day and he said, I won't believe what I saw. But it was, well, I couldn't figure out why all the, they were, the field workers were in there doing something, probably leafing or I don't know, something. And so I couldn't figure out why they were kicking the vines. And every time they would go up to a vine to start their work, they would kick it and they'd stand, and stand there and stare at the vine. And he, he like observed these guys doing it for about an hour. Well, it turns out that in the summer months, um, so the vines are completely hollow. You know, they're, they're, they're so old, they're completely hollow. In the summer months, the rattlesnakes come out of the hills and they slither up inside to not only stay cool, but to feed on mice that are in their hiding. And so that was, that's our story about a piece of it. She said, you ever go there, you got to be careful. <laughs> but anyway, so, so as he said, it's a field blend. Um, I don't even know what the varieties are in there. We, we, you know, we, we thought it not, but I, I sort of forgot it. Um, but you're going to notice, and this is just, you know, we try at my winery, we really try to make wines that have, have kind of taste of place. And this is a vineyard that repeatedly, year after year after year, we're talking about decades and decades and decades, always has this very distinctive spice tone. Sometimes it's like a minty white pepper, sometimes even like a little bit of a, you know the, um, the aroma of patchouli oil? Oh, yeah. Okay, a little bit of that, you know, this very exotic spice tone. You get definitely more of a deeper, more brooding, darker fruit, you know, more plum, blackberry, um, boysenberry, um, uh, kind of, you know, fruit intensity, maybe even a little bit of a mocha characteristic. 
Um, so I think probably maybe some would say more complex than the first one, but just different. And you know, again, speaking to the alcohol, it's 14 and a half percent. So here's an example of you know very complex, I think sort of old style Zinfandel, but the alcohol's in check and there's good acidity and it's definitely age worthy. Um, you know, sadly, a vineyard like this, I mean, we get, so it's, it's head grown, right? No trellising system. The vines just grow in the shape of the goblet. Uh, all dry farm. Um, you see that? Well, I don't know here. It's all dry farm. It's, it's amazing. Um, but the vines are very, very, very low yield. Uh, we get maybe a half a ton or a ton per acre. Um, we get maybe three, three and a half, four tons maybe on the Wallace Ranch. But it's a very expensive wine for us to make. And so one of the really sad things that it really made me happy to hear you say, Aaron, that you know, even you know, a winery like Gallo, right? That they really recognize that it's not about profitability. I mean, anybody who came along and bought this vineyard today who was a finance person would rip it out immediately. And this is what the tragedy is of fantastic Zinfandel vineyards in California is because they are low yielding and and they're, you know, they're not profitable. I mean, it, and, and so it's, uh, it's, it's a labor of love when we produce wines from these types of vineyards. And it's, it's one of the reasons why I'm so pleased that you're all here because I think it's terribly important for people in your position to really celebrate the, these, these heirloom vineyards and um, it, you know, showcase them to your customers because we don't want to end up in a world where these kinds of vineyards are all gone, right? And, and you know, people are only farming that would be just a tragedy. So I guess I'll get off my soapbox on that. <laughs> <laughs> but you can tell I'm really passionate about not only Zinfandel, but these particular sites. And, and just the Dry Creek Valley. Um, one, one, oh, one thing I wanted to just share about Dry Creek Valley, in case you haven't been there. So it's, it's a small region, 16 miles long, about a half a mile to maybe a mile at the widest point. And um, what it is, it's a very diverse little region. We have the hillsides and mountains and kind of hillsides and bench lands and, and sort of northern of the Valley. It's quite steep. And then, of course, you have the valley floor where we grow so and long. But one of the things that's really unique about our region is the fog influence. So while Drake Creek Valley, some would say, is maybe a warmer, not really a warm, it's not as warm as Alexander Valley, certainly not as warm as Napa, but it's, it's a warm planet. But it's very much affected by the Pacific Ocean and that fog or marine layer that comes in every day in the summer and uh, cools the grapes down. So we'll have maybe a 30 degree, 35 degree shift in temperature every day in the summer. It'll be cold and foggy at night, you know, 55, 50, 55, 60, 65 degrees. And then it'll get up into the 80s, 90s, and it can sometimes surpass 100 degrees in the day. But you know it's cold and foggy in the morning, and then 11 o'clock rolls around, and you got to take your jacket off, and then it's hot and summery. So um, that's what makes Dry Creek Valley such a unique region to grow grapes. Is um, you know, we get that nice long, slow maturation period for the grapes to ripen, and the cooling effect Zinfandel absolutely loves. And so it's how we also prevent the Zinfandels in our region from becoming too um, too uh, high in sugar and high and high alcohol. I, I really love the wallet and you see that peachy like yogurt almost like mm -hmm. like you said it's, it's not light but it's, it's a little more feminine it's fun. it's very fun, fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you can really see the old vines and the structure and how concentrated the wines are and as I think through you know we, we've said it a couple of times but how um, these wines pair with food I think it's really important when you slow cook something and you raise it and you and you condense it and you make it really intense in flavor. Sometimes with the older vines, I feel like that's a really perfect pairing. Like I'm just raising something all day long and I and I serve it with zen and it has this freshness, but at the same time it's concentrated. I think we need to think about that. One of my favorite pairings, I have a couple of them for zen, but um, I love like your style of zen when you just take a tomato at the peak of summer and you just cut the tomato open and leave it on your counter and you almost it's like becomes like a gazpacho. It's like sweet, that peak sweetness, but so fresh and in acidity and just amazing. But I also love the idea of some of like your style of dry creek when you're making like bolognese and you have like the ragu, the pork, the whatever, concentrating this tomato and you get like this intensity, but still it's fresh.
fresh. So I, I love tomato-based anything. Ketchup and burgers. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I think this is a really important thing. You know, when you make making barbecue sauce and then you start with that sweet and sour, tangy, all of these unripe and ripe flavors. So it's anything for Yes. Anything uh, tomato-based. Yeah. Is that, and there's not a lot of wines that can say that. That's true. Uh, yeah. Which frankly, Cabernet isn't not really good with that. Not good. Not good. Not good. And now, a word from our sponsor. Exploring the Wine Glass is brought to you by Dracina Wines. Dracina Wines is an artisan winery located in Paso Robles, California. They have been producing wine since 2013. Their first vintage began with one wine, their classic Cabernet Franc, which received a 91 in Wine Enthusiast. Since then, they have increased production, received several accolades, including double gold medals in the San Francisco Chronicle Wine Competition and consistent 90-plus ratings. In addition to their classic Cabernet Franc, they now produce a single vineyard, single clone, reserve Cabernet Franc, and a rosé of Syrah. Although they've increased production every year, they continue to sell out each vintage. Find out more about Dracina Wines and their award-winning wines at DracinaWines.com and let them help turn your moments into great memories. So I don't want to um, uh, uh, rush us along, but I'm mindful of the time. And I think what we can do maybe is have Aaron talk about wines seven and eight because those are two of the wines that you represent. And we'll taste along with uh, you, um, and then I'll talk about the, the other wines when the time comes. But um, we're going to talk about like this in, in 126-year-old vineyard, right? And, and how how it looks, how it farms, or how, how the wines showcase in your community. Don't don't tell them anything about the um, the concentration yet. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious. All right, absolutely. I'll just tell you a little bit about the block itself. Interestingly enough, our crew called it the Crossbow Block here. We call it the Crossbow Block. Uh -huh. uh, those little buggers are in here as well. Uh, it's a good hiding spot for other things for sure. Um, just tell you a little bit about Monterosso itself. Is uh, sort of southeast facing. Uh, it ranges from about 850 all the way up to 1300 feet. So we do sit above the fog layer on a light fog day. Fog ceilings typically run about 1,000 feet on a light fog day where it moves out quickly. On a heavy day where the fog hangs out until about noon, that ceiling can be upwards of 12, 13, 14 feet. We'll be just, just you know, kind of sitting in it for a while. Uh, but really neat spot on the north end of the Sonoma Valley. Uh, it's, where the, it's where the valley gets actually kind of narrow. It narrows down to about a half mile almost, which then reminds me of the same with where we are in the Dry Creek Valley. They both have that sort of same perspective where the cool air can rush in and out, but that warm air during the day, the hot air, it's almost trapped and it just sits there. It's nice that Zin needs kind of like this convection of uh, site, and it's really neat. That warm air just sits there on a nice hot day. Um, the winds will come to the rescue and cool it off, and uh, it's, it's a fantastic set. We have tremendous age. We have very red, as the name of so We have very red volcanic soil. Uh, as David mentioned, what's interesting is we've heard, I think now, several times the importance of acidity. Uh, so we too do not add acid uh, to the Monterosa wine. In fact, one of the things that we have to wait for is for that acidity to kind of reduce a little bit because it has a tartness and edginess. Uh, and once that softens up, that's one of our big indicators. So in addition to flavor, uh, we're looking for that acidity to start to soften up a bit. Most people look like you've tasted it. Uh, so I think when you when you've gone over the top, you're no longer expressing terroir. You're in the raisin molasses mode, right? And those are those big, just hedonistic, crazy high alcohol ones. Um, with this one, we have to quite high acidity, very high acidity, in fact. Uh, some good energy to the wine, good lift. Um, and for us, there's still that sort of, kind of little shiny five spice. There's kind of that spiciness to it, for sure. Uh, we do have an overplay with this wine as well that lifts that spiciness, but it's. I mean, we're looking for, again, that seamless texture, and almost just super velvety. Uh, and somebody had to do it. This wine is 16.2 alcohol. <laughs> 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 yeah, we're, we're, we're happy to, 
you know, a lot of the berries that have that good acid and have that good energy, they kind of showcase the place. Um, yeah, and if you don't notice a burn or a um, Monterosa, these little vines, they kind of struggle for dear life, and they're retaining that acidity to the best of their ability. Um, they're trying not to dehydrate, so what happens is the whole cluster itself kind of gets this nice, generous little bit of dimpling and shrivel. Um, and overall, when acids align with the sugars, it just happens to be that they're at, call it 28 at picking, and then by the time they soak out, they're down to 30. Um, but what that hillside site, again, it's we irrigate only in like heat spikes, preventative measures to keep them uh, to keep them alive. They're largely dry farm. They're on a hillside, hardly any soil. Uh, it's not very rich soil, that's for sure. Uh, these things are struggling for dear life, and so they really do drag it out um, and try and hold on to that acidity, and that's apparent. Monterosa is a very special site, um, and that acidity and that spiciness is sort of the telltale signature of its region for me. So Monterosso, the property is 550 acres. We have about 200 planted, and, and only about 43 is in. Again, it's been largely a Zen and Cabernet uh, vineyard in the past, and we have the oldest block on the ranch is actually the Semillon. Uh, it's kind of 134 years old, so it's a really neat stuff. But for us, um, for this wine, is it obnoxious? Are we trying to be high over the top, high alcohol Zen? No, we're actually just doing what these old buggers want to do. And it's got generous fruit, it's got seamless texture. It's actually 70% uh, new oak, and 50% French, 20% American. It seems like a huge amount of oak again. Let me come across as over oaked. Um, it's not your loose grain, intense coconut, whiskey lactone kind of American oak. Uh, that French oak is to impart a little bit of some texture and layers, um, almost add that kind of sandalwood and some of those nice spicy characters to it. But this wine on paper, and analytically, in my chemistry, looks like it has no restraint, right? This is a monster or a massive beast that it's in. But when you taste it, and you get all that flavor and texture and acid, I don't think it's, we think it's quite restrained. It's just when you look at the numbers, it all looks crazy. Uh, so anyway, that, hopefully that's an example of some sites that just really get very, very right. Uh, but ripeness also means a good retention of acidity and flavor and personality. The interesting thing about this one is like I, I almost want to take it to like um, like peaking duck house and just yeah. like you know think about like this like fatty, rich, intense, but somehow even though you have peaking duck, it's still is intense in flavor, but somehow like refreshing, you know? So like poison sauce mm -hmm. and those type of flavors. There's not a lot of wines we can really pair with that. It's how do you get light or how do you get intense flavor but still have some elegance? So I would love that, like five spice, and it's a really beautiful wine. And it's, it shows like power and um, also restraint. To me, sometimes these wines are interchangeable with like Amarone and this style, where you get a little bit of that date and fig. I mean, I mean, think about Amarone, it's big like this, but somehow it has so much acid that it almost feels like the shape is like starts off big but then narrows and becomes really elegant and I think this is a wine that well it doesn't have residual I don't maybe like the teeniest but a little residual dry. 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 But you can carry it from you know steakhouse wine list all the way through like yeah some dark chocolate. So it, it, it's really uh, in between and this one's this one's interesting from a food standpoint or some of the tastings that I've done with it, um, there's a perception of Oh, big wines, I don't like big things that are dry. They're too dry. And people with this one say, oh, this wine's got nice sweetness to it. Well, yeah, alcohol and some of the viscosity and sweetness to it. Um, so we actually get that sweetness. We can get the wine that are dry. And yet still have all that sweetness from alcohol. So I think alcohol in balance is pretty impressive what you can get to. And I'm not, again, justifying. Doing, okay. it for, doing it for showing, <laughs> for showing, <laughs> for showing, 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 for with like the brightness and then have the refreshing nature of this. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this character. 
Let's only 18% of how we don't. This line is. Uh, Bear Flies for us is, is a, a great sort of, um, we've been great at growings and we have been, as Kim described, the Dry Creek Valley uh, perfectly. So we're sort of on the eastern hill, more of the hillside, benchland as we slope down. Uh, it's called Fry Ranch. It's been there for a long, long, long time. We also have a ranch called Stefania, uh, which Stefania is on a road and rides the ridge line that separates the Alexander Valley from the Dry Creek Valley. So this is kind of fun for you. Geography, a little nerd out moment here. We've got the Alexander Valley is really warm. Uh, Dry Creek is narrow, but it's still warm. But one layer, one valley closer to the ocean. And then I noticed later we're going to actually have a line from Leonard that's actually from the Russian River. So we've got real sort of bright cherry berries. That's even cooler and closer to the ocean. And Zin definitely changes as you get closer to the ocean. Um, our Stefani Ranch rides that ridge of Alexander Valley and Dry Creek. Uh, so it tends to be weaker in soil, very generous and right, a little bit of Alexander Valley personality and a lot of Dry Creek personality as well. Uh, and these are some of our, some of our sites for Bear Flag. Uh, Bear Flag for us, uh, we, it's an origin story. We think the epicenter is in Sonoma County in general, um, with Sonoma Valley, obviously our Monterosa site is important to us, and then the Dry Creek Valley being what I consider some of the epicenter is in. That's where we're located. So, this is our tribute to the origin of Zen, uh, the Bear Flag Revolt in the town of Sonoma. That's where I was born and raised. Uh, kind of a fun little story and you know, local feel to it. Uh, the Zinfandel is, was planted in, in Sonoma as well as you know, Gajanville and, and Dry Creek. It's, I think Sonoma is Zen. By personality, it is Zen. Um, and so Bear Flag is our little tribute to that. It's county because we combine multiple valleys. So Dry Creek Valley plus Sonoma Valley equals Sonoma County. On the label, um, we tried to find a sweet spot in terms of fruit, oak, texture, alcohol, all things considered. And this wine would be your food friendly, much more, you know, not quite as personality, you know, quite as uh, stylized as the Monterosso is. Uh, a generosity of fruit, a little bit more apparent uh, tannin here, and a little bit more drip. And that layer and texture is from actually the Tisserat and Chirolio. Um, those are two varieties that we also plant uh, nearby. Try to use those just enough to push texture to where you know it's got some, some layers there and some density, uh, but still be sort of real reminiscent and more of that seamless texture. Uh, and a little color as well. That's, we call it a color blender. I think we use uh, Tietra as more of a texture blender. Torolio is certainly a color blender. Um, and when people look at Zen's, it, it's a whole a myriad of a, a spectrum. I think people look at this and go, it's got beautiful color. And Cold blenders help out a lot. In that case, there's 11 more central than this. It's 89% zen, 7% deep, and 4% troll ago. Uh, other than that, we're trying to, we've been growing grapes and growing really good zen for a long time, but the brands that we've been working on in some of our vehicles have just kind of floundered. And uh, we tried to resurrect this zen origin store again in 2015. It's our first vintage of Air Flag. So this is the second. We're off and running. Both 15 and 16 were great Zen vintages. I think that's another thing we need a little, little plug for the variety of Zen. No, I don't lose sleep over Zen in the vineyard. I lose sleep over Zen, uh, Zen in the fermenter. So it requires like a new perspective every day of looking what's in the tank. Your sugars change, your acids change, your alcohol. As it ferments, it's just unpredictable and changing every day as those more dehydrated berries soak up. Um, so it's a challenge, definitely a challenge. I lose sleep every year with Cabernet because Cabernet is so late ripening that we tend to pick a big slug right before the rain's down. And it's like winter's coming, right? We know this rain is coming, it's going to hit us, and whether it's late October or early November, if we're lucky. Um, but we've got so much of that Cabernet worry at the end of the season, it's late ripener. Zin is a sort of mid-season ripener. Uh, if you pull the trigger early, you can get it in late August, early September, and it's not uncommon to be done before you know, the first week of October. So with that, there's comfort. And knowing that, I don't think you have to look at the shelf and go, oh, it was a 15 was a tough year, or 17 was a bad year. Um, but Zen, I think we're almost exempt from those. It would have to be a, a traffic year uh, to be really bad for Zen. And the fact that the lunch, especially David brought a 2011 um, Ridge, which 2011 is a vintage, uh, vintage that I'd love to forget. And we'll have PTSD for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> that Zen was phenomenal. And it still showed fruit, and it still showed energy. Um, and you know, you can live past some early rains, but 
having a whole different ball game. So Zim is it's in a great spot. And that's really what you think about what should be in the site. Um, but you know, Cabernet is kind of the big bucks, Danny, big giant red one, popular worldwide. Um, but it's Zim wants to be in Brexit, Zim wants to be in Alexander Valley, Zim wants to be in Sonoma Valley. And you'll that, and you'll yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and for that, it's quality and it's wonderful to work with. So it's, it's great. So great. I'm going to give you guys um, a, a couple of minutes to try through the ones that I'm going to tell you about them at this case. And then we'll have some, uh, if you have any questions. I'm curious for the panel to think about soil types and how much that matters in the country. Maybe they'll comment on that in a second. Um, just because I'm curious about it, you know, what's the best soils or soil type or soils for Zim? Um, but I'll just tell you about wine number nine. So this is Segazio. Um, it's synonymous with Zinfandel, uh, the, the family, the Segazio family. Um, they came to the Alexander Valley in 1895. Um, so Ed, Eduardo Segazio is originally from uh, Piedmont, from Dogliani, uh, which is also the capital. Um, and this is about a 56-acre um, vineyard uh, plot in, um, in Alexander Valley called their home ranch. Um, Andy Robinson is a winemaker. He was a winemaker at Charles Krug. Um, and, I, and I really love the Segesia wines. I, I do some wine selecting for a company called, um, uh, well, it's wine till sold out, but that's a parent company, but it's called um, The Weekly Tasting. And I find um, the Segesia wines are just like, approachable. A lot of our clients are just getting started in, in wine and like the juicier styles. Um, this particular ranch is a clay and loam volcanic rock, low nutrient soil, which um, is really good for Zen to have uh, more concentrated flavors. Um, and so for me, this is 15.3 alcohol. I don't think you, you taste or smell it at all. Um, to me, this is a hedonistic, but savory, earthy, old world style of Zen, at least in this glass. So when I was tasting it, I was, you know, just like, yeah, it has a richness of texture, but um, it has almost like an earthier um, uh, aroma. Savory, right? Yeah, so like sometimes, and I love savory green styles of Zin as much as I like the yogurt, the fig, the dates. Um, and so to me, this is more of that like primitivo or even like the Croatian. A more rustic. Yeah, yeah more rustic. More rustic. Yeah, so like you guys are, we would talk about Primitivo, but you know, like the parent grade for Primitivo or the the, the, the idea is that it came from Croatia, from the, yeah, yeah, Tripodab or Celiac, Kostolowski, and, um, and so if any, at any point you guys would talk about that, but if, for me, when I taste the Segezio Home Ranch, I always think about those, like uh, the Croatian, you know, like, Baba, smelly, like they kind of have like almost like a irony, sea spray, nori kind of smell. That really is it's quite nice, I think. Any, any other comments about the It's really good, right? And that's the thing. I mean, when you think about the great grapes in the world, you think about the idea that they are so different from producer to producer, site to site. I mean, I think we absolutely need to keep Zen in that in that, um, in that the greatest clients of the world express different flavors depending on the soil, the, the land, the site, and the producer, of course. Um, okay, so that is Alexander Valley Segesio. And then number 10, um, as you already mentioned, is the Russian River. So um, this is a relatively new um, producer of wine called Leonard Wine Company. Um, they are father and son team from St. Louis. Um, uh, so, um, uh, blah, 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 blah. Leonard um, made wine at Turecto, Spotswood, Joseph Bells, or it has like some mentorship from there. Um, and they, their style, is, if you will, is avoiding the high brightness. They pick really early, they do cluster sorting, they de stem. Um, berry sorting, so anything that's raisins, they avoid. Um, and for me, this is the, an example that I, I felt like you could taste that uneven ripening, even though they, they sort. You do get that stewed and sour, um, some of that, uh, that, that kind of like, 
the line itself is just like there's a juxtaposition of the line itself where you feel like when you first taste it you get the like, intensity and then you get the sour refreshing acidity. I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts or comments or really doses. Like it's really yeah, really pretty. It's really typical of Russian pepper. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that that Pinot Noir style is you know right. or lighter weight, really great red fruits, uh, really attractive nose, you know, those long strawberry. Mm -hmm. Really nice and solid. I mean, uh, and, uh, and a lot of these cool blood vineyards in Russian River are threatened by Pinot Noir, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of being pulled out and being planted in, in and out of the Santa Valley, the Cabernet that threatens the old blood vineyard. So we're kind of getting threats in different directions depending on the appellation and what's out in that particular appellation. But you know, we make uh, Russian River and Santa Monica that you know, it's one of my favorites. It's really similar to this. It's really good. I was joked that I. My friends will probably kill me for saying this, and I don't really care, but I say the only the only Pinot Noir I like is the one that tastes like sin. I mean, I like Pinot Noir, but everyone like, thinks it's the sophisticated, elegant, like, you know wine when you're drinking Pinot Noir. But for me, I, I really enjoy these, like, sins that, that, yeah. that have this. And this is, this is definitely tricky for a blonde tasting. If you're tasting then like this, um, you know, uh, we, we have blind tasting happy hour here from four to six daily. And I probably would never put this wine in a blind tasting and um, for like people that were taking an exam because they, I think you would think this is a good one. They would never. Yes, it's it is. It's so bright and perfumed. Yeah, this is 2014. Exactly. Just this amazing brightness. Um, I think we might need my sister has those little strawberry shortcake dolls with the, the hair in them. Like, you know, that almost intense strawberry. And this one is so much vibrant strawberry, too. It's 2014, so yeah, really I, great. I got almost like a, a strawberry jolly rancher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that jolly, because it, it, to me it's very tart and very, you know, strawberry jolly rancher. So there's like, it's like mm -hmm. I guess that's the juxtaposition you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had those strawberry shortcake figurines as well. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like purple pork, you can that guy. I remember because my grandpa got me like this little strawberry shortcake streamer like beach cruiser and I thought it was like the coolest <laughs> person ever. Um, and so again, you see this this like starting off like tart, acidity, cherry, we have some fay qualities, we have some yogurty, apricot. I remember Lisa Granik, who's an MW and a really great venture of mine, and we were first doing blind tasting. She had, of course, mastered wine um, uh, way of thinking. That you often get like white fruit or stone fruit in Zen, especially from cooler sites, and you have to remember that apricot, peaches, you know, that that really like beautiful cherry, uh, white cherry, you know. So uh, I'm glad we can show that as well. So next up is my number 11, it's Peachy Cannon, um, Casa Robles, uh, planted uh, in 1988, uh, Nancy and Doug, uh, the Founders of the estate have um, had a, a 500 case winery. Um, this is a single uh, vineyard estate from uh, Zinfandel Pot, which is called Mustard Springs, and four different zones of Zin. Um, it's between two, in, in Paso, this is actually a, a, an area where you have some of the vineyards north south facing, and half of them, and then half of them are east west facing. So it's between two hills. So you kind of get a little bit more of a a cooler part of Paso. Um, I think you can see this to me when I tasted it last night, it was like savory and green. Um, you know how it's showing at the moment. But uh, we often think still we're like in Paso, it should be big and rich and intense, but I think because of these different um, the way that the, the, the fine space, um, you get some of that, again, sweet and sour. Tangerine, yeah, there's definitely citrus, right? To me, this is wild. So yeah, there's some cool canyons in Paso, some areas that exactly. are definitely a little cooler. This has that, I get, that was that marmalade we mentioned, the apricot character. There's yeah. such a unique uh, spectrum to this one. It's, it's very different. Um, the green, I would say for us, if we're going to embrace speaking on behalf of those in the, in the north, being a business center coast, but in the north, north bay, um, any green that we would get, you've often heard the term bramble, like that blackberry picket mm -hmm. kind of that character, that's real reminiscent of the greens that we would get. And sometimes that takes a while to shake off. And if it's there, it's fine. It's not vegetative or green or off-putting. It's just this unique bramble character. Um, this is striking. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and that's where the zinc really does not do well. Yeah. So you have to be careful with that. But what does well there is petite straw. So if you're careful about what you plant where, you can sort of work around that. And then it doesn't like wet feed at all, the, the, the zinc and that. So as we get closer to the Russian River and the soils get heavier and damper, um, that the zinc is not happy there. And we'll not work well on that. Well. Uh, and the other one, um, we also have a lot of iron in our soil, but what I love about that area is, I keep mentioning we're in the coastal range. The coastal range is an mountain range that's still building, um, and there's also this fault there. So we have metamorphic, we have igneous, we have sedimentary rock, the two. So my, what I like about that is I figure that's just going to add to the complexity to the grapes that are growing on that site. Uh, the two main soil types that we have in the Primitivo block, about 10 acres, is corny gravelly loam and something called Poisitas clay. So the clay has the iron content, and um, you know, we're at a little bit of elevation because I said we're in the rolling hill, so it's really well drained. So I, it, my impression is you have the clay because you have some big cracks and stuff that I in the block, but then on top of that is this alluvial fan, this ancient alluvial fan. Um, so we have boulders like this big throughout the block. So I I don't know if this is true, but I believe that that adds to some mineral minerality in the wine that I get more. So there's that block and we have the Greek block that has a lot of those big boulders. And I just get this savory layered component that I don't get in the other more Sedimentary dominant uh, soil state law. I think there's better definitions of where it's in not be. They just said that really, really well. Um, any breeze, any wind, all this, everybody's discussing coastal and this, uh, this effect, whether it's environmental shift in temperature, morning to night, assisted by the ocean, but uh, that's why one country is one country. That's where we're situated. Proximity to the ocean and the, the air, so it's it's all it's all climate, um, all earth. It's, it's it's a lovely location for it. Oddly enough, I have a little. Zin does great where chili peppers get the hottest, which is fun. Because our vineyard crew, our vineyard crew, everywhere we have always has a little garden nearby, uh, almost every vineyard site, and the chilies off Monterosso are new there. The chilies on Stefani in a good year are just super hot. Um, so it's funny to have an indicator to you know, sort of other plants, uh, and to me, that you can just sell a great vintage, and the right climate when the chilies are thriving, they look good, and at the end of the season, they're so hot, it's like, okay, my blood's going to touch them. Um, and that's, that's, that's quite interesting, too, because like, when you think about high spicy food, you almost always want to avoid alcohol if you don't like spice, but I would imagine that there's a significant amount of people that love the heat and spice, and the spicier, the better, so... The more high alcohol wines. Yeah, our tolerance for spice is sky high. Yeah, yeah nothing based on so. So um, I guess to close out, uh, for a couple minutes later, then I would have to it. Yeah, we'll ask you a couple of questions, but I wanted to thank you all for your time. I know you're all busy. Um, on behalf of the staff, I would say, you know, we should drink more Zinfandel. We should be more advocates for Zinfandel because it is one of the great wines that makes California um, what it is, which you said so perfectly in the beginning, you know, the American dream, um, just to come here to the gold rush and have these vines that we thought were native, but turns out they're from our great, great grandparents that brought them over. So really, as we think about California as it's built, it should be um, bought together. So we would hate to see some of these vines being ripped up just to make a profit. Um, it's like the returning really to like these native grapes um, and it's really important that we keep these great sites alive so that we understand how different these, these wines can be and express for sure. So, all right, thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been another episode of Exploring the Wine Glass. Thanks for listening. If you have suggestions on what topics you would like me to discuss, please reach out on social media. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook as Exploring the Wine Glass.
I'm also on LinkedIn as Lori Hoyt Budd. Of course, you can always email me at exploringthewineglass at gmail.com. If you enjoyed our podcast, please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast catcher to help others find me more easily. Until next week, slancha.